you would open your Bible to Acts chapter 1. We're going to be begin reading there in verse number 6. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. As they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing, stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Again in John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, the Bible tells us, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Other words of Jesus in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. There are certain facts that we must never, ever doubt. One of those about the Bible that we can be certain of is that Jesus will come again. He will return. The apostles were told that as they gazed intently into the sky. Jesus said that to the apostles in John chapter 14, right after he had told them that he would be killed and that he would rise again and that Peter would deny him three times. He comforted them and letting them know, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I will come again so that you can be with me. These words, when we think about them, and then he's told the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3, I will come quickly. Now, we may look at this and say, well, he hasn't come back yet. Well, Peter addresses that, doesn't he, in verse number 9 of 2 Peter 3. God's time frame is not ours. He has no time frame. There is no time with God. Time is for us. It is for us to measure the days and the seasons. It is not for God. God knows when he will send Jesus again. We do not. But we know that he will come again. And we can know that for certain. So we must be prepared. Fact. It's a fact that Jesus will return. It's not not just a possibility. It's not something that might or might not happen. It will happen. Jesus said it over and over again. I will. Imperatively stating, this is going to happen. And so we must be ready. There are many who have predicted the return of Christ at certain times, certain days. They've said, this is it. This is the time when Jesus will come. But they've been sadly mistaken. The Bible clearly teaches us in Matthew 24, 36, that no one knows the hour. It cannot be figured out. It is not a mystery to be solved. The only part we need to know is that he will come again. Why is it that God hasn't told us that? Have you ever stopped to really think about it? Why is everyone so obsessed? Well, 
I say everyone, most people, whenever they want to, to pin it down and say, well, this is it. Why is that? Because, well, now we have a goal, we have a, a date, we have a time, so we got to get ready for that time to come. Because everything else in our life is like that, isn't it? Everything else is like that. We know when things are going to happen, or we, at least when we plan for them to happen. We make plans, and certainly we should. But this is something we must plan for, not knowing when it will occur. God, in his infinite wisdom, wants us to serve him every day of our life, as if the day was today. What a wonderful thing for us. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to be concerned about it. We just live every single day as if this is the day that I'm going to face judgment. This is the day that Jesus is coming back to claim his own. What a wonderful time that will be. When we look carefully at the account here in 2 Peter, we, we can learn a lot of things. One of those is certainly that we need to be prepared. But he gives us something, I think, three specific things we're going to look at today that we need to look at and, and decide, is this what I'm doing as far as it relates to Jesus coming again? If you haven't already, mark your, your Bible there in 2 Peter 3, but we're going to be looking at several passages. But we're going to refer back to 2 Peter 3 at least three more times before the end of the lesson. First off, are you desiring for Jesus to come again? Is this some, something you desire? Hastening. We're going to look at that second phrase there in verse 12. Looking for and hastening the coming of Christ. What does that entail? Well, one of the ways we can look at that is look at these other verses where this particular Greek word is used. It's not a word that we normally use, uh, haste. I, I, I don't think I, I use that word in everyday conversation very, very often. Unless I'm quoting that cliche, haste makes waste. And then I might use that particular word. But it's not a word we normally look at, but it, it literally means to hurry. That I want to hurry Jesus here. I want him to come quickly. Now, Jesus said that in Revelation. But again, the quickly is God's quickly, not, not ours, not man's. But God's quickly. So when we look at this, look at, look at the different places there. That I've, I'm not going to cover each one of those, but they're there on the screen for you. Those are the other places that this particular Greek word is used, plus in our text in 2 Peter 3. Our desire then should be great. It should be something where we wake up each and every morning and thank the Lord that we have another day to serve Him and then pray to Him, Lord, come quickly. We should desire to be with our Savior. We should desire to want to spend eternity with Him. Peter tells us that we need to hasten the day. We need to hasten it. We need to understand that it's better to be with Christ than it is to be here. As great as there are pleasures in this world, absolutely there are. But they pale by far in comparison to the joys of heaven, of what Christ has waiting for us as he prepares that place for us. In Philippians 1, 21 to 24, Paul told the Christians, Therefore, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. Because, but I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Paul said, I, I, I have so much I need to do. There's so much that I want to do. There's so much that I, I want to teach you and, and help you in your Christian walk. But, man, I really want to be with Christ. Because that's much better. I think each of us know what's going on in this life. We look around and we know this life. We know our life. 
We know about what our workday is going to be. We know, we know what we're going to do for the day. We've, we've sort of have an, an idea in our mind what we're going to do. And so this life is what we know. We don't know heaven. We won't know it until this life is over and we're found faithful in the end. If we are found faithful in the end, then we'll know the joy of heaven and we'll know what Paul's talking about here. But Paul knew that heaven would be better. And he desired to be with Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8, he put it this way, Therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Is that what you desire? Do you desire to be, have that home that Jesus is preparing for you? Do you, look, do you want to look for that day? Do you want that day to come? Paul says we walk by faith, not by sight. We, don't, we haven't seen heaven. We, we have a faith and a trust in God that it's there, that it's real. That Jesus is indeed preparing that home for us. And so we should desire that. We should have the confidence to say, I'm doing the things I need to do in order to receive that home that Jesus has gone to prepare for me as a faithful Christian. Familiar with Hebrews 9, 27 to 28, I want to look at it maybe a, a slightly different way. And it, it says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, now I want you to notice this last part, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, and especially this last phrase now, to those who eagerly await him. Who's Jesus coming to, to claim? Those who are waiting for him eagerly. Those who say to their, their God as they pray through Jesus Christ each day, Lord, I want you to come quickly. Does that mean I don't desire to be with my family? That I don't desire to be among you? Is that what that prayer means? No. It means I want to be with the Lord even more than to be here. There's many things I want to experience in this life before my life is over and the Lord does come back. I look forward to many things. I hope one day to have grandchildren. Boy, I feel sorry for their parents. But I look forward to that. But I should look even more forward to being with my Lord than that. I look forward to doing things this summer, going to camp and experiencing the, the wonderfulness of seeing those young children learn about God and become closer to one another. You all know how much going to India means to me now. I look forward to that, but I want to look more forward to going home to be with my Lord. I want to hasten that day. Every year I get a, there's a day that I turn another year older. I'll be honest, I, I'm not hastening that day anymore. There was a time I wanted to hasten that day, but I'm not hastening that day anymore. They can wait. Do you desire to see Jesus come back. In the first part of verse 12, it says that we are, need to be looking for. Looking for. Are you looking for his coming? Well, what, is, what does that entail? What does that mean? Why is Peter telling me that I need to look for it? The Greek word also means the same thing in a way as hastening. 
I need to be eagerly waiting for it. Eagerly seeking it. Looking for and hastening. Seeking and quickly awaiting. Eagerly awaiting. It's something I, I just, every day I think about it. Jesus is coming back. What am I doing about that? What am I, what am I thinking about Jesus coming back? Titus 2, 11 through 14 tells us, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for, look at that phrase again, looking for, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem, to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. If I'm looking for and, and hastening the coming of Christ, I'm going to be out doing the things he wants me to do. I'm going to read his word and, and get the instruction that I need to have so that I can do the things that are right and good in his sight. And so whenever I'm looking and hastening for it, it's not something that I'm, I'm sitting back and just waiting for him to come. I'm out there doing the things he wants me to do. I'm out there understanding what it is, who he is, and understanding that I'm, if I'm a Christian, I'm one of his, and I can look for his return. And it's a positive thing in my life. It's something that I want. It's something I desire. It's something I know will happen. And I'm okay with it. Because I'm doing the things he would ask me to do. And if I'm not doing those things, ah, Jesus, could you wait just a little bit longer? That's the attitude that I'm going to have. If I have not become a Christian, I'm saying, Lord, you know, please don't, don't come back. Or if you come back, you know, just let me in. Let, let me be that exception. Oh, wait a minute now. Have you ever looked for an exception to someone who has not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you ever looked for an exception to someone who is, who is not obedient to God, that God was okay with that? Have you searched the Bible to find an exception so you can be that exception? There's not one. You're not going to find it. It's not in there. So if you want to be right when Jesus does come back, and he will, you've got to do what he says. You've got to be that people, that purified people. You've got to be a Christian. Stand right before him. Paul put it like this in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in not any other nation, not in a worldly nation, not in a country, not in some place that only Christians can go to. Well, wait, yeah, it is, isn't it? It's, but it's not on this world. He says, for our citizenship is in heaven. We celebrate so many things about our country that are wonderful and good. And I'm, even though we have many problems, I'm still proud to be an American. But I think that all of us, if we're Christians, the thing we should be most proud of is our citizenship in the kingdom of Christ. More than anything else in our lives, that's something we should take great pride in and confidence in. This is a kingdom that will last forever. This is a kingdom that was established from a heavenly design. This is a kingdom that Jesus gave his life for so that it could come into existence. And on that day of Pentecost, when the first gospel sermon was preached, and Jesus crucified was preached, and people received that word that was implanted in their hearts. 
and they were baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins, and they rose to begin their new walk. The Bible says in Acts 2 and verse 47 that he added them to the church. The Lord added them. We are citizen, citizenship is in heaven, Paul says, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. That's a beautiful passage. My citizenship is in heaven. If I'm a Christian and that's where my citizenship is, one day my, this body is going to be done away with, with all of its frailties, with all of its weaknesses, with all of its, its things that are just are wrong. It's going to be changed into an eternal body, one that will last forever, that has no pain and aches when I wake up in the morning my knees will no longer pop when I get up from a sitting position. I'm not going to get tired. You're not going to get tired. If you're a Christian and you found faithful in the end and you're there with Jesus, it says we're going to behold him and we're going to, have, we're going to conform to the body of his glory. What a beautiful thing. Do we eagerly await that? Are we seeking that? Are we looking for that? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as Paul was introducing this letter, he said many good things about the church, the Christians there in Corinth. Beginning in verse, eight, verse 4, rather, he says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony of concerning Christ was confirmed in you so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next point. We should be hastening and we should be looking but are you living for his return? Suggest to you that if you're doing the, the first two, you're doing the last one. If you're doing the last one, you're doing the first two. We need to be living for his return. There's a phrase there in 2 Peter 3.11, whenever he's talking about how you ought to be, that English word does not do the Greek word justice at all. The Greek word literally means it's something you must be doing. If you understand that Jesus is coming back and you understand this world's going to be burned up and everything that you know it is going to be gone, everything that you have is going to be gone, there is nothing from this life that will go into heaven. We have to understand that. That's something we must come to grips with. It's hard because, again, this is all we know. We don't know what heaven's going to be like exactly. And I think sometimes that, that holds people back. I really do. I think sometimes that little bit of doubt of, oh, man, I just want to know. I just want to know how it's going to be. Have you ever started a new job? And that first day you walk in and you have no idea what it's going to be like. Even if it's something you may have changed jobs and it's the same profession, you don't know the people, you don't know how everybody operates. And so you walk in and you, you want to know, but you have no idea until you get in there and start doing it. Well, with heaven, we're not going to know. We can read in the Bible the description of heaven and we can know it's going to be wonderful and it's going to be great, but we're never going to know the fullness of that and how great it's going to be until we get there. And I think that does hold some people back because they're, I, well, nobody's gone to heaven and come back and said how great it is. So I, I don't know. We don't have to know all of it. Jesus doesn't tell us that we have to know all of it. What we need to know is he's going to be there. 
What we need to know is that he's already there preparing that place for us. And he's told us that he's coming again. God's not slow about his promise. Why? Why, why does it, Peter tell us that? He's not slow about his promise. It's, it's going to happen. We can't look at it and say, well, it hasn't happened in my grandfather's lifetime or my great-grandfather or his grandfather, on and on. It hasn't happened, so maybe it's not going to happen. God, that's, I think that's why Peter tells us, don't think about God in the same terms as you think of everything else in this world. Because God's not of this world. He's a spirit, John 4, 24. He's a spirit. He's a being. And so I think Peter tells us, don't look at it like that. But look at it like this. It's a promise from God. And every promise that God has ever made has come true. There's not one promise that God has ever made that where he said, you know what, I'm not going to do that. God's not going to change his mind and do something different than send Jesus back. It's just not going to happen. No matter what theories are out there, the Bible clearly teaches Jesus is coming back. Jude verse 21 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Again in Philippians 1, beginning in verse 9, the Bible says, In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's something that we, we can look at those words and we, those need to be in our minds impressed upon us. These are the things we need to be doing. I need to be living as if Jesus is returning. That's what Paul's telling me. Remember the words of Paul as his life was coming to an end. 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now the appearing he's talking about there is not the second appearance that Jesus will make, but the first appearance. If you've loved the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, Love that God sent him into the world to be the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. If you love that, and you're living then for the return of him. And that reward that Paul speaks about can be yours also. Peter tells us, he tells us to trust in the promises of God and live our lives according, according to that knowledge. And to the knowledge that Jesus is going to come back. And the earth and all we know it is going to be destroyed. As Christians, we should look for and desire that his return happens soon. Once again, this may cause us some pause. Some pause to consider how do we truly view this idea that Jesus is coming back. This morning... I want you to understand that this lesson has been brought to you not with the idea of you need to be scared and in fear of Jesus coming back. But I would dare say that if you're not looking for and hastening the return of Christ, and if you're not living for his return, then I dare say you ought to be scared. You ought to have the fear of God in your heart. Because if he comes back and you're not right, if you're not a Christian, there's no other choice that he will have 
but to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And how sad that would be. How sad that would be when you had a chance of the hope of heaven and you didn't take it. So the Bible in so many ways is simple and yet it is complex. God has a plan for you and for me. And part of that plan is knowing that Jesus will come back and me, all of us, doing what we can to be ready for that day. Just so happens that a great day coming is the invitation song. I didn't ask for it. Jason didn't know what I was preaching on. If you're looking for and hastening the coming of his day and you're living for his return, it's going to be a great day. There's a verse in there that says it's a sad day coming. God is so clear that if you don't obey the gospel, if you don't know who God is, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 to, to 10, clearly says you're going to suffer eternal destruction. That's so sad. But the good news is that I can be a Christian. You can become a Christian if you're not one. And if you are a Christian, you need to get right with God so that you can start once again, starting each day, praying for the Lord to come quickly so that you can be home with Him. Is Jesus preparing that home for you right now? If He's not, come forward now while we stand and sing.